I'm not going to use the microphone. It's really bright. <laughs> so <coughs> I'll make the voice as loud as possible. Um, so I want to talk about something really exciting today. And I recognise I'm in a government building with, I'm assuming, predominantly government workers. And I want to talk about process. And it's lunchtime. <laughs> 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 process. I'm sure you've all heard process. Sometimes process becomes more important than the outcome. Um, I'm, I've, I've dealt with that myself. I'm being filmed, aren't I? Mm -hmm. Better be very careful. <laughs> Particularly around <laughs> procurement. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to talk about today is following the process for MAR will actually put you a long way towards getting the best outcome. So the process is just as important as the outcome. And when I say process, I'm talking about following the policy, which is um, the Department of Water and Environmental Regulations, and the National Guidelines, which is, they're both tied to that. So it's very important. And I'll acknowledge uh, Karen Johnson's in the audience from Managed Recharge, and she's been the lead principal hydrogeologist on this project for the best part of six and a half years now. So. Um, it's through her great work that we were successful in, in securing the award, so thanks Karen. Now, when I talk about process, there's four critical steps I want to talk about, which we consider to be the main steps. So this is a sort of a sub-step to, st to stage two, which is the development of the operating strategy, which is really important because it will it'll drive fundamentally your operating budget. So that operating strategy will be tied to your licence requirements, and I'll, and I'll get to that. But a little bit of background about the Hartfield Park project. Um, many of you are probably familiar with it, some of you won't be. What triggered the, the implementation of that alternative water um, project was in 2010, uh, the, the city, or then Shire, commissioned a master plan for that reserve. Now, at the time we were going through a lot of population growth, and Hartfield Park's our largest uh, regional reserve. So it has a lot of sporting fields, a golf club. It's also a class A reserve. It has uh, declared rare fauna, threatened eco ecological community, and it's a Aboriginal heritage site. It's a really good site if you want to get anything done <laughs> in terms of process and approvals. It's, it's fantastic. So we needed that study identified a number of things, but one of them was the, the need to expand the existing uh, space available for active sports. Essentially what's, what's been happening down there is the local community can't get their kids into the clubs because they're at capacity. So you're having to turn people away. And that's, that's, not, that's not synonymous just with the city of Kalamunda, that's across the metro area. So we looked at this, they did the, they did the, the, the master plan and one, one of the key deliverables in there was to look for an alternative water source. And that was in 2010, so that's when I got involved. And when we looked at it, we looked at three options actually. Um, treated wastewater, uh, stormwater harvesting, and we actually also looked at sewer mining. That was quickly struck off the list because of the, the cost. Because we have the main distribution pipe running through the corner of the park for the forest field suburb, so there's a fair bit of flow through there. But we simply couldn't undertake that, it was too cost prohibitive. We then looked at treated wastewater, we're simply too far away from the nearest treatment plant. So we were quickly uh, drew, drew down to stormwater. And what's sort of great about that reserve being so large, um, was a few things that, that make MAR work really well there. One, there's two main drains that run through the site, or one just adjacent to the site. Um, Two, the leadable aquifer is actually pinches right up at the site, so it's not that deep. So, and three, it's such a large site that when we looked at the, <coughs> the feasibility of it, the risks associated with the water leaving that site, it's just not going to leave the site, it's too big. Based on the volumes that we're putting in. So the risk of contaminant to other users, because we pull it out every year, it, it was quite low. So. Back to the process, oh, it's a very exciting topic. And I am a big advocate for this process. I'm not an advocate for all process. Okay. <laughs> I, I initially worked in the private sector, so I was 
What do you mean I have to get two quotes? No $500. <laughs> what do you get two quotes? Oh, you can't, no, you can't negotiate. No, I'm not allowed to do that. It's about open practice, not necessarily best practice. And it took me a while, 10 years actually, I'm just sort of grasping it. So. But it's really, really important to follow the process to get the best outcome for MAR. So stage one is the desktop study. That's the first stage you're going to do. And in that desktop study, there's three fundamental outcomes you're looking for in order to get you a viability analysis, which will take you to whether or not you go to stage two. So stage one is purely a desktop study, and it's about using the information you've got to determine whether or not, first fundamental, you've got the demand for the water. Don't go, MAR's a solution, let's try and find a problem to attach it to. Don't get into that trap. So you must have a demand. We had a demand because we're predominantly pulling from the level and it's over allocated. So the superficial in the foothills is a bit hit and miss. There are some areas where it's not too bad, but it's generally not that great. So, and we were looking at a five hectare expansion. And we actually got the funding to deliver the whole master plan through a state government election in 2013, I think it was. So, $6 million grant. And they gave it all to me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's still going. Two years for approvals. Anyway, I won't go into that. That's not for this project. That's for just clearing the, the, uh, the land and that. So, if you get enough yeses to go to stage two, and you want to go back to council or go back to your, your managers and, and say, I want some money to, to do a stage two assessment, please do not do a whole of life cost. Do not do it. It is not the stage to do it. And we're so fixated on whole of life costs in government, particularly when we're implementing assets. Once you've done your desktop study, the key outcome from that and the objective from that is whether you say, no, this is not viable or it, we need to do more investigation, go to stage two. Okay? It's not the time to talk about what, what it's going to cost because you don't actually know what you're building. Because every side will be slightly different, depending on what you're, what you're trying to do. And at the moment, I know councils in particular, or the people I talk to, what does it, what does it cost down? What does it cost to, to run? What's it? And I've got a pretty good handle on it because we're six years down the line. But we didn't start talking about costs until the end of stage two. So what you're building into your stage two assessment is you're obviously doing a detailed assessment of the site. And you're still addressing those three fundamentals. By that stage, demand, you've already addressed that. So you're really looking at the water quality and sustainability of the source of that water, and same with the aquifer. And this is where the national guidelines and the policy is really important, because they will actually drive your infrastructure, believe it or not. And that's done through addressing the risk assessment. So you've got 12, 12 key risks, isn't it, Karen? 12 key risks in the national guidelines. That will drive your infrastructure. So that will tell you from a, from a performance point of view what you need to go and buy in order to achieve that, to address the risks associated with what you're doing. And for us, one of the major risks was the uh, particle size and the turbidity. So for us, we're not, we're not uh, it's a fit for purpose scheme where we're not using the water for drinking water, it's for irrigation only. So. Um, the, as far as the Department of Health are concerned, and yes, they are a stakeholder, uh, and they will require to give you the, the tick. Um, it's considered low risk because it's not human consumption. But the risk is protecting the aquif aquifer. So we, we, everything we do on that site is we don't want to clog it and we don't want to contaminate the aquifer. So we're lucky in the, where we're drawing water. It's, the water's actually pretty good. So um, very good for a main drain. So. We're lucky in that respect. Um, so stage two, you get to the end of that, and then you have a look at it and go, I think we've got enough evidence here to go to stage three. Before you go to stage three, and you're, al you're almost at the point where you can do a whole of life course, yay. <laughs> so before you go to stage three, you need to develop an operating strategy. Okay? Now, once you conclude stage two, that gives you all your evidence through your study to then seek the relevant licences. 
And for us, from a licensing perspective, it was a first port of call was WaterCorp, so WaterCorp asset. So we had to get approval to interface the infrastructure. Then the second one is from the Department of Water and Environmental Regulations. <laughs> I was saying that in the car on the way here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get it wrong. Is, is to interface the bank again, a permit to interface the bank. Then you'll need a surface water license to take the water from the source. In our case, it's a main drain. And then you'll need another license which comes later after you've injected and you've submitted your, your report to extract it out of the aquifer. Okay? And the ratio will depend on how, how good your data is and the nature of your infrastructure. So if you're direct injecting, I'm going on a limb here, but I'll assume you'll get a better ratio than infiltrating. You've got more loss. So we can't infiltrate at our site because the site geology, geology doesn't allow it, so we direct inject. Now, that operating strategy will determine what you need to do to oblige your license conditions, and you must do that. Now we're at that stage, so we've finished stage two. We've done our operating strategy, which is tied to our license. So we're telling, we're telling the um, custodians of the license, which is the Department of Water and Environmental Regulations, that this is what we're going to do. So now you're in a position to know roughly what your operating costs are going to be. Because you're telling them how often you're going to test the water, at what stages. You're going to tell them all your monitoring requirements and your metering requirements. So you know roughly what it's going to cost to manage this infrastructure. At the end of stage two, you get all your licences and then the fun begins and you go to stage three, which is a trial. And I'd recommend probably a three year trial, that's what we've done because you tend to learn a lot through a trial. And the challenge when you're dealing with council, I'm only talking to, to local government here, it's not a categorical statement, but is you've got, to get, you've got to get their heads around the fact that you're asking for money and you want to trial the project. And my advice is it's not about saying it's going to fail or succeed. It's about learning through the process so you can make it more efficient. So it's not about failing or, or, or succeeding. If you've got a detailed stage two assessment, you've, you've spent the money, you've done all the on-ground research, you do a lot of testing in that stage, it, your trial will more, more, than, more, more often than not probably work, but what's critical at that stage is identifying from the client perspective or the principal or the person owning it, who is actually going to own it. So who's going to be the project manager? That is very, very important for a scheme like this because you want continuity and, and someone generally needs to, to own it. Um, so whoever you identify to take it on, you want to make sure you pay them well. <laughs> you were. Can you, can you send this to the <laughs> city of Pondland? So, yeah, it's important that um, you create that continuity because it's, it's not a quick process and it's not a cheap process. It's, it's, it takes time and it takes uh, dedication. Um, we're sharing what we've done with anyone else who's interested, so I'm hoping for the next person will be a lot easier. But um, that's why we, we promote it as a demonstration site and so does the uh, department. So, um, you know, what we've learned, we, we share. Now, through that trial, then you're at a stage, you're going to have to tell me how the time's going as well. Mm -hmm. You're then at the stage where um, you can start looking at what infrastructure package you need. And, and I'll say this, you know, there's no such thing as I'll just put out a tender for the MAR package. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't exist. So um, what we've learned through the development of our infrastructure is a system that involves three, it involves three separate companies. Okay, so we had the extraction tender, we had the filtration package tender, and then we had the injection valve tender. And they're all completely independent, totally separate companies, and we had to get that technology talking to each other. So it's an automated system. So 
That's why allowing three years is a good idea for your trial because you've only got a short window when we can harvest. We only harvest in winter and we're using existing and production bore because it was during a trial we weren't going to put down a dedicated injection bore when we had a perfectly good uh, production bore on site for irrigation. Having said that, we did do a lot of investigation into that bore um, where we, we inspected it with a CCTV camera and made sure it was structurally sound to to uh, on injection. So, um, but yeah, getting that infrastructure and really what, what I strongly advise is your stage two assessment will provide you with the performance parameters for what you go and get. So it's not a, it's not a prescriptive specification, it's descriptive. So really what you're after is I want water filled with two micron and whatever else you need. And let the, let the uh, providers tell you how they're going to do it. One thing we built into our tender is bear in mind our system has to be very simple. It's managed <coughs> by uh, irrigation staff in, in winter at the city. So we have to look after it. So we, we looked at, um, we built into the, the actual uh, spec that uh, we needed the annual maintenance costs and annual running costs of or whatever they were providing. So that went a long way to awarding that tender. And the filtering side of it was critical, but the valve is also very critical um, as well. So we build this thing, we go to turn it on, of course you just don't go and turn it on, because it doesn't happen. So, and then you commission it in the winter of 14, 15, where we've got no rain, so that was also handy. But uh, what we learnt through that first year was, was huge, because we learnt that what we had identified as probably a lower risk, which was the total organic carbon, uh, it came back as a much higher risk. And it's through following this process, that we then implemented an activated carbon. And I'm happy to say we've just concluded uh, this winter's trial. We've had a lot of success. Um, we've got a lot of evidence to say, to say we've uh, reduced all the clogging and the water quality is great. We've got all the photographic evidence on the screen. So the introduction of that activated carbon has worked really well. And um, once again, it just is, I'm advocating for the process. So. Um, don't, and, and I'm, all, I'm always at a point now where I can do a whole of life cost, seven years down the road. It's funny how we selectively apply that as well, I've noticed, in, in, in uh, local government. So, uh, if you do something new, it's really important to do a whole life cost to something new. Because if you build an oval, they're not, not really interested. Because I understand they have to build the oval, because the community needs it. Or you build a library, the community needs it. So. There's not, it's still there, but it's not as, I guess, the, the pressure on doing it for this project, which I came under, uh, was a bit more selective. So, because um, it's something a bit different. But I would advocate strongly not to get too caught up in that too early. You need the data. You actually need to know what you're building. And you need that operating strategy. And then you actually need to go to tender. So, depending on which filter package you choose, will determine your uh, operating costs. So those sorts of things are really important. How much time have we got? Five minutes. Five minutes. We'll finish up sh shortly. One, one thing, I'll just share my how this has changed my philosophy around uh, stormwater. So I've been working in local government for 10 years and when I started as a supervisor and I was uh, stuck my hand up early on to be a supervisor for for call outs. I'll never do that again. <laughs> and winter would come around and I used to hate it when it rained and there was a storm because I knew I was going to get a phone call and there would be localised flooding somewhere. And we're getting more and more of that too because we're getting a lot more violent short, short events. So, and we know that because part of our operating strategy at Hartfield Park is we don't take water during a flush event and we're getting more and more flush events before it cleans up. So we shut down for 24 hours because the water uh, is obviously carrying a lot more contaminants during those vents. So we, we just don't take it. So, I, yes, so I, I used to hate I used to hate, hate it when it would storm and rain. I used to hate to having to go out and fix these drains. Um, but now I've got a completely different philosophy. A lot of people see it as a, a bit of a burden infrastructure, stormwater. It goes in, it's a sort of set and forget. You do your street sweeping, you do your preventative gully inducting, but really, we don't value what's passing through it. So, 
I'm fortunate enough, where I live, I live right at the start of the source of the Woodla Pine Brook where we take water out of in the hills. So when it rains on my road, I see that water and I go, there's an opportunity there for us to harvest some water. And if it's interesting how we look at the, let's look at the, the groundwater resource in WA. Let's look at it as a bank account. Now I know Nick's in the room from the city of Melbourne. If I was asked Nick, Nick, last night, how many withdrawals did you make out of that, uh, out of that bank account? He'll be able to tell me to the litre how much water was extracted from his licences at the city of Melbourne. We are very, very good and we are exceptionally good, the groundwater managers in, in Western Australia, the guys who look after all the irrigation, exceptionally good at knowing how much water they're pulling out of the aquifers. Highly sophisticated central control systems that monitor nightly, hourly, minute, even to the minute, how much water they're, they're, they're debiting. I'd love to see a situation, it's an interesting hypothesis, I know, where we adopt some similar technologies into how many credits we're putting back into the bank. And I'm fortunate enough that we've sort of doing that a little bit so we can go, oh, yeah, we pulled this much out this year, but we actually put a little bit back. So it changed, it's changed my philosophy on how I look at stormwater. I want to value what's passing through it. Um, and, yes, it will be... It'd be great to, to see, we might actually start cleaning it up a bit too if we, we sort of valued the water as well. So, um, yeah, that's me. Done.